Hi guys, in this tutorial we are going to work our way through the concepts behind the clinical features of portal hypertension. Let's start by covering some important terminology. The term systemic circulation refers to blood flow from the left side of the heart through the capillary bed of an organ and returning back to the right side of the heart. Contrast this to the term portal circulation which refers to blood flow from the capillary bed of one organ through larger blood vessels into the capillary bed of another organ before returning to the right side of the heart. For the remainder of this tutorial, the term portal circulation will relate specifically to the flow of blood from digestive organs through the liver and back to the heart. Elsewhere you may hear this referred to as the hepatic portal circulation. Now with this terminology in hand, let's briefly touch on some basic anatomy depicted in cartoon form relevant to this tutorial. The esophagus connects to the stomach, which in turn leads to the small intestine. The small intestine flows into the first part of the large bowel or colon, called the ascending colon, which in turn flows into the transverse colon, to the descending colon, to the sigmoid colon, and through to the rectum and anus. Other relevant anatomy involve the spleen, the pancreas, and of course the liver. Blood from these digestive organs contain deoxygenated, nutrient-rich blood which flows through the portal vein into the liver for processing before release into the systemic circulation via the hepatic vein and the inferior vena cava back to the right side of the heart. The portal circulation can be considered as any of these vessels in blue. Now, with this background in hand, we are ready to discuss the clinical condition of portal hypertension. Portal hypertension is caused by blockage of blood flow anywhere along this portal circulation pathway. As an analogy, normally the gates to blood flow in the portal circulation pathway are open, but due to a variety of causes, these gates can close. When this happens, blood has nowhere to go, and due to the increasing hydrostatic pressure, blood flow eventually flows back to its origins in the portal circulation. The increased pressures within the portal circulation and blood backflow are the basic underlying mechanisms for the common features seen in portal hypertension. The increased hydrostatic pressures within the portal circulation capillaries leads to fluid leakage into the peritoneal cavity, which is called ascites. This would be clinically evident by a distended abdomen. In addition, the increased portal circulation pressures and blood backflow leads to splenic congestion of blood, which eventually leads to splenic enlargement, which is called splenomegaly. Because blood cells can accumulate in the spleen and are effectively taken out of the systemic circulation, you may see a reduction in the amount of red blood cells called anemia, a reduction in the amount of platelets called thrombocytopenia, and a reduction in the amount of white blood cells called leukopenia. If all three of these cell lines are simultaneously reduced, this is called pancytopenia. A large spleen can also cause pain in the left upper quadrant of the abdomen and it may press on the stomach which may lead to early satiety or feeling full after eating less food than the individual, individual normally would. Another problem with portal hypertension is when blood backflow leads to blood diversion into the systemic circulation via alternate vessels called portal caval anastomoses. Porto refers to the portal circulation, caval refers to the inferior vena cava, whilst anastomoses means a communication between vessels. So therefore the term portal caval anastomoses simply means a direct blood flow from the portal circulation to the systemic circulation via the inferior vena cava and therefore bypassing the liver. When recruited, these vessels, which do not normally have significant blood flow, develop marked dilatations and are called varices. Examples include esophageal and gastric varices, anorectal varices or internal hemorrhoids, and paraumbilical varices called caput medusa. The major risk with varices, especially esophageal varices, is their risk of rupture which can cause life-threatening bleeding. If initial measures such as endoscopic management and medications like non-selective beta blockers fail to prevent recurrent variceal bleeding, a procedure called a, called a transjugular intrahepatic portosystemic shunt or TIPS may be utilised. A TIPS procedure connects the portal circulation directly with the systemic circulation, bypassing the liver. This restores the direction of portal blood flow, normalises portal venous pressures, reduces varices and their risk of rupture, 
two other important clinical features of portal hypertension, a hepatopulmonary and hepatorenal syndrome. Their mechanisms are incompletely understood, but are thought to be secondary to portal hypertension release of vasodilatory mediators like nitrous oxide. In hepatopulmonary syndrome, both the lungs are structurally normal and histologically normal. The vasodilatory mediators cause vasodilation of the alveolar capillaries. This leads to a mismatch between the ventilation of the alveoli and the perfusion of the alveoli of blood. Characteristic clinical features of hepatopulmonary syndrome include breathlessness or dyspnea, platypnea or breathlessness when sitting up which is improved by lying flat, orthodoxia or deoxygenation when sitting up, and hypoxemia or low oxygen concentrations in the blood. There are no effective medical therapies for this condition. Correction of the cause of portal hypertension is essential if possible, and if appropriate, involves an early referral for a liver transplant. Hypoxemia warrants long-term oxygen therapy. In hepatorenal syndrome, the kidneys are again normal, both structurally and histologically. The portal hypertension triggered release of vasodilatory mediators leads to arterial vasodilation, which affects the splanchnic or gastrointestinal circulation to a greater degree than the peripheral circulation. This results in a reduced effective arterial circulating volume with a resultant decrease in perfusion of the kidneys. The renin angiotensin aldosterone system is activated which causes the kidneys to retain sodium and water. The fluid retention can lead to worsening ascites and edema and eventually the fluid overload reaches a point that impairs cardiac output of the heart which in turn further reduces effective arterial circulating volume. Apart from the edema, other clinical features would be a progressive rise in serum creatinine, a low urinary sodium due to activation of the renin angiotensin aldosterone system, and as the kidneys are normal, a benign urinary sediment with no proteinuria. Apart from correction of the underlying cause of portal hypertension, management involves medications which constrict the splanchnic circulation. The causes of portal hypertension can be categorized based on the level of obstruction to portal blood flow. Prehepatic portal hypertension is caused by obstruction in the portal vein. Posthepatic portal hypertension is due to interruption of normal blood flow between the liver and the heart. While intrahepatic portal hypertension, which is the most common type, is due to obstruction of intrahepatic blood flow. The main cause of this is liver cirrhosis, of which there are many causes in itself. Check out our video on liver cirrhosis for more on this important topic. That brings us to the end of this tutorial. So from me, this is goodbye. Thanks for watching and be sure to check out our other videos. Feel free to leave requests in the comment section.